in the Battle of Uhud, Muslims were 850 and the enemy army was 3,000. In the Battle of Al-Khandaq, Muslims were 3,000 against 10,000. In the Battle of Zuqarad, Muslims were 40 against 500. See the difference? In the Battle of Khaybar, Muslims were 1,400 against 10,000. In the Battle of Mu'tah, Muslims were 3,000 against 200,000. I will say it again in case you didn't process the numbers. 3,000 against 200,000. In the Battle of Hunayn, Muslims were 12,000 against 25,000. Thousand. Salam alaikum. If they knew that their enemy was much, much more powerful than them, then they shouldn't have started a war against them. Engaging in a war against a superpower is not from the teachings of Islam, as that is considered suicide, and suicide is haram. You will only cause death for your own innocent people by the hands of your enemy. And Allah said in Quran, وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَ Do not throw yourselves into destruction. Therefore, the war against a stronger enemy is haram. It is like bringing death and destruction upon yourself and upon your people. I'm not going to expose the faces of people who are making this claim. Because maybe they are not intentionally lying, maybe they are just deluded. This is part of the propaganda that is spreading now in social media, propagated by the oppressors trying to convince people to give up their rights without resistance. What I will do in this video is I will debunk the claim with evidence, without revealing the faces of people who are propagating this. I just want to make sure that our Muslim brothers and sisters will not fall for this lie. So bring your coffee and let's start. The Muslims living in Mecca were tortured, persecuted, sometimes killed. That was ongoing for years. The Kuffar even put the Muslims in something that looks like an open air prison for three years where they prevented them from their basic needs including food itself until the Muslims started to eat tree leaves just to stay alive. It is called the Valley of Abu Talib. Google it for more. Anyway, in the end, Muslims had to evacuate their homes, leave their land and wealth behind and live as refugees in another city called Medina. This is the part of the story that we need to focus on. Choice number one, fight the disbelievers who tortured and killed us and drove us out of our homes knowing that they are much, much more powerful than us in terms of numbers and equipment and so on. Number two, be happy that we are still alive and leave the oppressors enjoy the homes they stole from us and celebrate their oppression claiming that if we fight them, that will be considered suicide. That was an actual debate between the believers back then. And this debate was settled only by revelation. Surat Al-Anfal, verse 6. They dispute with you, O Prophet, about the truth after it has been obvious and clear for them. As if they are being driven to death in front of their own eyes. Allah is condemning in this verse those who were afraid of death. Those who said, we will only fight if we are sure that we are more powerful than our enemy. But when it comes to fighting when we are weak, mm, they start to make excuses. Then Allah ordered the battle of Badr, which was from dunya perspective, from the logic of a man without faith, impossible to win. As the enemy were multiple times more powerful in number and in war equipment. And subhanallah, victory was for the weaker party, the Muslims. Some might say, what about the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 195? 
ولا تلقوا بأيديكم إلى التهلكة. Do not throw yourselves into destruction. Isn't that a clear command that starting an unfair war against a much more powerful enemy is wrong? Isn't that clear command not to fight an enemy who is known to be killing thousands of civilians without feeling any remorse? And the answer is very simple. Please stop reading half verses and taking them out of context. Please read the full thing to understand. First, Allah ordered the Muslims to fight who fight them. فمن اعتدى عليكم فاعتدوا عليه بمثل ما اعتدى عليه. So if anyone attacks you, retaliate in the same manner. Then the Muslim community were split into three groups. Group number one said, we will physically fight. We will go to battle and sacrifice our own lives for the sake of Allah. Group number two said, we will sacrifice our money to buy war equipment for the fighters. And group number three unfortunately said, we don't want to sacrifice our lives for the sake of Allah nor spend our money for the sake of Allah to support the fighters. In this verse, Allah is condemning the third group. He is telling them, وَأَنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَةِ Spend money for the sake of Allah and do not throw yourselves into destructions which means sacrifice your money to help start the war against the much, much, much more powerful army or I will punish you with destruction. If you don't fight for the sake of Allah with your lives or at least with your money, I will destroy you. See the difference between reading the full verse and reading part of it out of context? Completely different meaning, right? The destruction is not fighting the battle. The destruction is deciding not to fight. Imagine the irony when the same verse is used to convince Muslims to be cowards. And it's not the first time that happened. In the year 55 Hijri calendar, when the Muslims were surrounding the Roman army in Jerusalem, one courageous man went into the middle of the Roman soldiers and fought a huge number of them alone. Then some of the Muslims said, what is he doing? He is throwing himself into destruction. That is against the commands of Allah. Referring to the same verse. Then immediately the Sahabi, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, may Allah be pleased with him, condemned them for what they were saying. This is exactly his speech to them. Subhanallah, this verse of the Quran was revealed to us Al-Ansar. This verse was condemning us when we refused to fight for the sake of Allah. God taught us that we will bring destruction upon ourselves if we decide not to fight for the sake of Allah with our lives and our money. Now you are quoting the same verse to do the opposite? I hope it's clear now. Brothers and sisters, victory only comes from Allah. وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ Victory only comes from Allah, the Almighty, all wise. كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Those believers who were certain that they would meet Allah in the end, they said, How many times has a small force vanquished a mighty army by the will of Allah? And Allah is always with the patient ones. Numbers don't matter. Equipment doesn't matter. And weapons don't matter. In the Battle of Badr, the enemy of Islam was three times larger in numbers and many times larger in equipment. In the Battle of Uhud, Muslims were 850 and the enemy army was 3,000. In the Battle of Al-Khandaq, Muslims were 3,000 against 10,000. In the Battle of Zuqarad, Muslims were 40 against 500. See the difference? In the Battle of Khaybar, Muslims were 1,400 against 10,000. In the Battle of Mu'tah, Muslims were 3,000 against 200,000. I will say it again in case you didn't process the numbers. 3,000 against 
200,000. In the Battle of Hunayn, Muslims were 12,000 against 25,000. Think about the numbers and ask yourself, if it is haram for Muslims to participate in a battle knowing that they are much weaker than their enemy, as they are claiming, why did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, approve all of these battles? Even better, why did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, command Muslims to fight these battles? And before you claim that it is only related to the life of the Prophet because Allah sent angels to support and blah blah blah, in the battle of al qadisiyah Muslims were 30,000 and the Kuffar were how many? 200,000. Not only numbers, but those 200,000 had the advanced weapons of the Persian Empire. They also had 80,000 more in reserve and support. And the Muslims won this battle against the superpower that was called the Persian Empire. In the Battle of Malazgard, Muslims were between 20 to 30,000, and they were up against 150 to 200,000 fighters from the superpower that was called the Roman Empire, with all their advanced weapons and warfare equipment. The Muslims won, and they also took the Roman Emperor himself, Romanos IV, into captivity. There were and will always be cowards looking for a way to manipulate the words of God to justify their cowardness. Don't listen to them. They ask people not to fight their occupier unless they are strong enough to do so, as if for some reason the occupier will ever allow them to be strong enough to resist him. That doesn't make sense. The same cowards were pushing back the 7 million Algerian heroes who sacrificed their lives defending their families, their land, and their dignity against the evil French occupier. The same cowards were pushing back the Egyptian heroes who sacrificed their lives defending their families, their land, and their dignity against the evil British occupier. And the same cowards will always be pushing back resistant fighters striving against every evil. According to this hadith, if you turn away from striving for the sake of Allah, He will send upon you humiliation that will never ever be lifted up from you except if you go back to your religion. Allah decreed conflict and He promised victory. Victory is coming anyway with or without you. It is just delayed to show the real believers from others. And it is an opportunity for some to be martyrs and to show the hypocrites. Again, it will happen with or without you. You just have an opportunity to choose a side. Don't be like the son of Noah who refused to board the ship with him, claiming that it is more logical to seek refuge from the flood on top of a mountain. Don't. Just follow the orders of God as it is. Don't let your arrogance give you more confidence in your own logic than your confidence in the commands of Allah. And finally, I want to end this video the same way the man that we all love and admire ends his amazing speeches. He raises one finger and says, وَإِنَّهُ لَجِهَاد نَصْرٌ أَوْ استشهاد. It is a strive for the sake of Allah, either victory or death. And Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, وهي تجري بهم في موج كالجبال ونادى نوح ابنه وكان في معزل وكان في معزل يا بني اركم معنا يا بني اركم معنا ولا تكن مع الكافرين 
قال سآوي إلى جبل يعصمني من الماء قال لا عاصم اليوم من أمر الله إلا من رحم وحال بينهما الموج فكان من المغرقين وقيل يا أرض بلعي ماءك ويا سماء أقلعي ويا سماء أقلعي وغيض الماء وقضي الأمر وغيض الماء وقضي الأمر واستوت على الجودي وقيل بعدا للقوم الظالمين ونادى نوح ربه فقال رب إن ابني من أهلي فقال رب إن ابني من أهلي وإن وعدك الحق وإن وعدك الحق وأنت أحكم الحاكمين قال يا نوح إنه ليس من أهلك إنه عمل غير صالح فلا تسألني ما ليس لك به علم إني أعظك أن تكون من الجاهلين قال رب إني أعوذ بك أن أسألك ما ليس لي به علم وإلا تغفر لي وترحمني أكن من الخاسرين 